turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we started just a couple of weeks ago, our study of Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. You remember Paul, on his second missionary journey, uh, went in there and basically led some people to Christ, and the church formed, and then, of course, he left, and they kept up with him, and uh, they, they've kept up with him all the way. Paul's in prison in Rome. They send a gift to him, and, uh, and so he's writing that. And so when we look at this, uh, we see that he's writing this letter to thank the Philippians for the gifts they sent. We'll talk more about it. In fact, it's mentioned a couple of more times in the letter. And then he wants to encourage the Philippians to live a joyous Christian life in the trials and problems of life. They were actually being persecuted for their faith in the same way that Paul was. And then in our culture and society today, as time goes by, more and more times that people are going to be persecuted or made fun of or there's going to be conflicts because we stand for Jesus Christ and that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and he's the Savior, and there's no other way. So we're seeing that. So as Paul writes, he, he is uh, encouraging them, basically thanking them and encouraging them. And this morning, as we look, he, he wants to remind them because they may be thinking, they may say, you know, here's Paul. He's traveled all over the world, and now he's stuck in prison. Paul wants to write to them to remind them that the Word of God is not bound, that nothing can stop it, and it is a great truth for all of us, and nothing can stop the message of Jesus Christ, and so uh, we'll, we'll think about that. Let me raise some questions just for us to think about. First of all, how should we view the circumstances of our lives? And then the second thing, which is kind of a little bit unusual, what should be our motive for service? Because we're going to find that Paul talks about the motive for proclaiming the gospel, and, and we'll see what they said. Well, uh, a question that could, uh, could ask every one of us, and it's kind of the key, is why do you think God left you on this earth? You know, you believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life, and, and you're here. Some people say, well, I'm here to, to be happy or to make a name for myself or to enjoy life. But we all know really as believers, we're here for Jesus Christ. And, and we think about it, uh, Paul tells us in this passage, he says this, Paul's desire is that in all things, God would be glorified in his life. Whether he lives or dies, Paul says, I want my life to, to count for Jesus Christ. When we think about each one of us in this room, all of us, we could think exactly the same thing. There are many things we could focus on. We could say, we want to be like Christ. We want to make disciples. We want to love God and our neighbor. We want to know the Bible. But it could all be summed up in this, that our purpose is to bring glory to God in our lives. And that's what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 20. He says, Right now, whether in life or death, that God, that Jesus Christ would be exalted in my life, in my body. He's saying that God would be glorified. And that's for us, every one of us in this room. We could say, what are we here for that God would be glorified? And so we're going to see Paul talks about that. Let me remind you again where we are. Paul, on his second missionary journey, went into the city called Philippi. He led a woman to Christ. He led the jailer to Christ. He got the people together. They formed a local body. Paul was there for a while. He left. After he left, they continued to support Paul. They sent things to Paul. They kept up with him. Some years have passed. Maybe 10 years have passed since he was there. Paul went to Jerusalem. He got arrested. He got put into prison uh, in Caesarea for two years. And then he was taken to Rome. And now he's been in Rome in prison, most likely for about two years there. So four years, of, the last four years of Paul's life, he's been in prison. And of course, while he was there, they sent him a gift, at least, to say, we've heard Paul's in prison. A guy by the name of Papaditus came and sent the gift to Paul. They came into the jail, to the prison, gave it to him. And then Paul is writing this letter and asking the Papaditis to take it back and to thank them. Now, we saw last week as we got the introduction and uh, last time, last week was Easter and we did something a little bit different there. But as we look at it, we saw that Paul prays for these people. And we think about prayer and we say, what do you pray for? We say, well, you know, I've told y'all that, that you should get, get you a little notebook or, or an iPad or something and write down a prayer list and say, here's people. And you write down their names and you say, okay, what can I pray for these people about? And, and you do that on an ongoing basis. You'll see answers to prayer. You'll see amazing things. What, what did Paul pray for these people? Well, he prayed this. We saw it last time that the, their love would grow. They would make wise choices. They would be holy believers. And the end result, that God would be glorified. That's what he says. That's what he wants in all our lives is God to be glorified. So he said that their love would grow more and more. They'd make wise choices. They'd understand what's the best things to, to do and that they would end up being holy believers with the end with the end up goal of that God would be glorified in their lives. So we, we could say that. Now when he writes to them, you understand, and we mentioned earlier, they're going through some trials. And so why would he write them? He said, 
people of Philippians are going through persecution as a local church as they stood for Christ. You understand that as, as time keeps going, if Jesus doesn't come get us soon, there may be times in our lives that we as a local church could be persecuted. Time is, you know, the, the culture's changing, the country's changing, things are changing, and what we believe and stand for, some people don't like. And, and just as in the first century when these people would say that there's only one God and it's Jesus Christ and he's the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him and it's faith alone and Christ alone, that was attacked. Well, it is an attack today as well. And, and so the Philippians, he writes, because they're being persecuted for what they believe. And then the second thing is he's writing because the Philippians were upset that Paul was in prison. And, and if you think about that, they could be saying something like, why does Paul have to go to prison? Paul, Paul is supposed to go all around the world and tell people about Jesus and form all these churches, but now he's in prison. In fact, he's been in prison for four years. And so we're going to see what Paul says about all of that. Uh, here's the outline for this morning, and we'll go fairly quickly through it. It's, it's not real deep things, but it's some great things to think about. Uh, we're going to see that the Word of God is still going out. Paul says it's going out. Nothing can stop it. He's, we're going to see the motive for ministry, and this may surprise you. It, actually, when you study this, uh, if you've never really studied this before, this will surprise you, this one part about what were the motives for proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Because what is your motive? What is your motive for living for Jesus Christ? What is your motive for being a Christian? What is your motive for wanting people to know that you have believed in Christ? What is the motive that you want to serve Christ? And so we talk about that. And then Paul talks about the goal of his life and that's toward the end. So let, let's start with, with he wants to encourage him because the word of God is not bound. And listen, this is going to be so strange. He's actually going to say, that the word of God, the gospel has spread due to the fact that he's in prison. Now, they would think the opposite way. Paul had been arrested. He's been in prison for now four straight years. The Philippians could say, this is so bad. This is the man that led us to Christ. This is the man that started the Thessalonican church. This is the man that started the Corinthian church. This is the man that started the Roman church. This is the man. And they could say all those things. And they say, and now he's in prison. Gee, this is terrible. This, this is not good. But Paul says, no, 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 no. I want you to understand that even though I'm in prison, nothing can stop the word of God. In fact, it's continuing to spread even because I'm in prison. And we're going to see it. Look at verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1. He says, now I want you to know, brethren, he's talking to the Philippians. He says, I want you to know that my circumstances as being in prison have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Now, what he actually says is this, that because I'm in prison, it's actually caused the process of the progress of the gospel. In other words, this word progress actually it was the word used for an enemy, like a, an army, and they're capturing things, and they're moving along the ground, and they're capturing more and more territory. He's actually saying the gospel is just keeps increasing. It keeps going out more and more. Because I'm in prison, we'd say, what? How could that be? He says, well, I want you to know, brother, my circumstances have actually turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. It, I've, it's caused it to spread. And, and we understand, listen, there are no accidents with God. It's not just a, a bad luck of faith or bad luck that Paul's in prison in Rome. Because God, that God is the sovereign ruler and he works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so there are no accidents and he is proclaiming the gospel message. And he says, look, nothing can stop the progress of the gospel. And do you know nothing can stop what we do? You can go out from this place every day and you can make an impact for Jesus Christ and nothing can stop it. You can tell people about Jesus Christ they may not believe right then, but the word of God is alive and powerful and it goes. And so nothing can stop the gospel. Let's talk about it for just a second. The gospel is the good news. There is the gospel message, the gospel response, and the gospel offer. Think about it, that John 3.16 is the great verse. God so loved the world, that's us, that he gave his son, gave him to what? To die on the cross to pay for sin. That's the gospel message. That whosoever anyone would believe the response is to believe believing him would never perish but have what is the offer eternal life god loved us jesus died and rose again whoever believes in him receives the gift of eternal life we have that message we have the greatest message of all 
Every one of us in this room ought to be excited. You've got a message that when a person understands it and believes it, they go from hell to heaven. They go from not understanding to having eternal life and being with Jesus Christ forever. You have that message. We have that message. So Paul says, listen, I want you to understand, first of all, that nothing stops that message. It doesn't matter. Nothing can stop that message. In fact, the great truth, and we, I think we actually sang one of this part, it says, we, God causes all things to work together for good. Those that love God, those are called according to his purposes. Listen, God's in control. And anything that looks, even it looks bad, we can say, gosh, it's so bad that Paul's in prison. prison. Paul says, it's not bad. Uh, the message is going out even more. We're doing a study on Wednesday night on the patriarchs, and we've been looking at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We just now got Joseph's life, and we just started, and Joseph started off great, but now he's in, he, he became a slave, got, and then he's into prison, and, and all of these things, and it looks so bad, but later when he talks to his brothers, and they did some things to him, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And sometimes things look bad, and we go, gosh, that's bad. It's so bad, Paul's in prison. Paul says, it's not that bad. It's not bad because the gospel is going out. The message of salvation is going out. And so the trials and the problems that we have, sometimes we say, why is this happening? You have to say, Lord, I have to trust you because there's nothing by chance. You're working all things uh, according to the counsel of your will. You know, everyone has ups and downs and problems and trials and events. And, and look at lives. And we think about people. And I, I found this, and I thought it was pretty interesting when we think about how God uses people. Think about this right here. If you put a person and lock them in prison and they, you have a John Bunyan. You know, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Process. Pilgrim, uh, but when did he write it? He wrote it when he was in prison. They put him in prison. When he was in prison, he wrote it. You, you put him in poverty, you have an Abraham Lincoln. You have paralysis, you have a Franklin Roosevelt. You, you burn him. This is one of my favorite. You burn him so severely that the doctors say he'll never walk again. And you have Glenn Cunningham, who set the world one-mile record in 1934. And they said, you never walk again. He sets the world record. You deafen him, and you got Beethoven. You call him, I love this one. You call him a slow learner. Write him off as uneducatable, and you got Albert Einstein. God takes and uses everything, the ups, the downs, the goods, the bads. God takes it and uses it. So Paul says this. Listen, I don't, don't, be, don't be upset. Me being in prison has actually caused the furtherance of the gospel. And in your life, the events and the ups and the downs and the trials and the good, God is using that and he's going to use that so that you can be faithful to take the message of Christ into this community. Well, he says there's two things here. He says, I want you to understand that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And there have been two things. One, the message was spreading by, by Roman soldiers and by fellow believers. And you go, Roman soldiers? What, what are you talking about? Well, first of all, look at verse 13. Paul says, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard and to everyone else. He says, first, the soldiers. Soldiers know about my imprisonment. Well, what do you mean? Listen, Paul wasn't in a dungeon. In the prison in Rome, when he wrote this, he was in what's called house arrest. So he had a place to live. People could come visit him, but he was chained to a Roman soldier all the time so he couldn't escape, so to speak. And so about every four hours or every six hours or however they did it, a new Roman soldier would come in and be chained to Paul. And so what do you think Paul said? I've got a message for you I'd like to talk to you about. And think how many Roman soldiers, the Praetorium Guards, he says that the Praetorium Guards is throughout everywhere. They know about why I'm in prison. You know that they say that there were 10,000 uh, Praetorium Guards. They got double pay. They were highly respected. They were smarter than the average uh, soldier. And here they come guarding Paul. And Paul is telling them about Jesus. And many of them are believing in Christ. So Paul says, listen, because of my imprisonment, the cause of Christ has become well known throughout all the Praetorium Guard. They, they all know about it and to everyone else. Can you see one of the soldiers? He says, it's my time to go in there, but I know what he's going to talk about when I get in there, right? I mean, this is what happened. So Paul was sharing his faith with these Roman soldiers and many of them the believed. And so the first way the gospel uh, advanced is that Paul was... Paul was in prison, and the Roman soldiers were hearing the message. Can you imagine that Paul had a, 
a ca- court of a captive audience, right? They thought Paul was in prison, but really <laughs> he was, they were in prison listening to him because he's going to tell them the great message. But there's more. But besides the soldiers, it was advancing through the fellow believers. Watch this. Fellow believers are bold to proclaim the gospel. Let me read this verse for you. He says, and, because he says the guards, and he says in verse 14, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. They have courage to speak the word of God. He says, listen, because I'm in prison, they have courage to speak the word without fear. They're ready to go. They're ready to stand. They're saying, if they're going to put Paul in prison, then they'll have to put me in prison. I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ. And as the persecution comes, and it's going to come sometime, it may be in our lifetime, unless Jesus comes and takes us out, it's going to happen, and you're going to have to stand, and you're going to have to say, it doesn't matter what they do, nothing's going to stop me. These people were bold. You and I have got to be bold. We've got to stand for Christ regardless of what happens. And he says that because of my imprisonment, the brethren trusting God because of my imprisonment have far more courage. They have courage to speak the word of God. You know what you might expect, that when Paul got put into prison, they would go, ooh, oh, I'm not saying anything because I don't want to get put in prison. No, they did just the opposite. They said, if they put him in prison, they'll have to put me in prison. And every one of us in this room, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to stand for Christ because the culture is getting worse and worse and worse? And are we going to stand for Christ in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, in our friendships, all of those things? Are we going to say, I'm standing for Jesus Christ and that I may lose friends. I might lose a job. I might lose something else. Am I willing to stand for Christ? Are we bold? Paul says, they are bold now because they see me in prison. They're ready to stand. Should we be bold? Look, the Bible says he'll never leave us or forsake us. Why should we fear? We have the greatest message of all, Roman. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. We have the message that takes people from hell to heaven. We have the greatest message of all. And are we worried that somebody might be offended by what we say? Are we worried that our next door neighbor might not talk to us anymore if we actually share our faith with them? Are we willing to stand? These people, when they saw Paul get put into prison, they said, well, they're going to have to put us into prison because we're not stopping. Really powerful. Really powerful. They were bold. So what do we do? We got to know the message. We got to pray for the opportunities. And we got to have boldness when time comes to go out and to tell the truth. Pray for boldness. I, I read um, this cute little thing the other day, and, and, and let me just read it to you. It says this. Uh, after listening to Chuck Swindoll on the radio, an eight-year-old Debbie asked her six-year-old brother, David, do you know about Jesus? And of course, he had heard about Jesus, but he thought maybe this is going to be a different story. So he says, no, tell me. And she said, okay, sit down. This is real scary. After explaining the gospel as only an eight-year-old could, she popped the big question. Now, David... When you die, do you want to go to heaven and be with Jesus, God, your mommy and daddy, and your big sister? Or do you want to go to the lake of fire to be with the devil and bank robbers? And he thought for a minute, and he said, I think I just want to stay right here, you know? (laughs) And that's what we, you know, so sometimes we think sharing our faith, how easy is it? Sometimes it's not that easy, but we have the greatest Greatest privilege. So he says they're bold. And so two ways the gospel is advancing through all these guards. Can you imagine how many Roman soldiers may have believed in Christ because Paul was in prison and they were chained to Paul? So you could say, well, Paul, it's bad you were in prison. He said, no, it's not. There are people hearing the gospel that I would have never got a chance to talk to them. And then the other believers are so bold. They're so exciting. They're telling other people. And that's what we're to do. And so Paul's in prison. So let, let me raise a question because he, 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 he then turns to a different point. He's talking about everybody standing. And then he says this. He says, you know, when people are proclaiming the message, they have different motives. And then we might stop for a second and say, what is, what is our motive for serving God? Why do you, if you said, I want my life to count for Christ, I want to serve Christ, I want to live for him while I'm on this earth, why? What is your motive? What is your motive for doing what you do? Whatever way you serve, if you share your faith or you do something, what is your motive? And, and we're going to see that, that Paul's going to talk about motives. And look what he says in verse 15. He says, some, they're talking about sharing the message, some to be sure are preaching Christ 
even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. He says there's a thing out there that some people's motives, they're, they do it out of envy and strife. They're jealous of Paul, but some do it out of goodwill. Have you thought about that? That while Paul was in prison, there were actually Christians who shared their faith, and they did it because they thought it's going to make Paul mad. It's going to hurt Paul's feelings. Paul doesn't get to share the faith, but I do. They were jealous of Paul. They were envious of Paul. You think about that, and you say, no, 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 everybody loved Paul. No, and everybody doesn't love you, and everybody doesn't love me. There are some times that people don't get along. And can you imagine at the time that Paul was there, that there were believers that thought it's going to hurt Paul when I share my faith. So I'm going to share my faith and make Paul jealous because he can't do it because he's in prison. So Paul says, some out of envy and strife and some from goodwill share the message. Now, I've got to tell you something. This is a little bit unique. I've got to just show you something um, because the next two verses... Uh, I've already read the scripture. If you have a King James or a New King James Bible, you're going to find that what I'm about to read is going to be a little different. The New American Standard, the NIV, the ESV, uh, the Christian Standard, all hold to this reading that verse 16, if you look at your Bible, verse 16 says, the latter do it out of love. And verse 17 says, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. If you have a King James or a new King James, they swap the verses around. What is verse 17 in the New American Standard is verse 16 in the King James and vice versa. And you say, why is that? Well, the only thing we know is that the King James Bible was made by a guy by the name of Erasmus many, many years ago. He had six Greek manuscripts, and apparently the manuscripts he had had verse 17 in our verse 16, and their, our verse 16 in their verse 17. We know that the New American Standard, the ESV, the NIV, they were all made based off 6,000 Greek manuscripts, and most of those manuscripts read it this way. So I don't want you to get upset. There's nothing wrong. If you got a King James, they just the verses are opposite. So when I read verse 16, just look down at verse 17. And when I read verse 17, just look back at verse 16 or whatever. So I just want you to see that because sometimes, I mean, I've had people, I've taught this before, but I've had people come up and say, why is, why is it different? I it was just two different translations. Nothing's changed. They're exactly the same except the verses are uh, reversed. So let's go back to verse 15 for a second. He says, some, to be sure, preach Christ from envy and strife and some from goodwill. And then he explains it. He says, the latter, the ones who do it from goodwill, the, the latter do it uh, out of love. Out of love for God, out of love for Paul, out of love for one another. He says, that they latter do it out of love, knowing I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. They're standing for me. They're, they're proclaiming the message because they know that one of these days I'm going to stand before Caesar and I'm going to tell him about eternal life. So we already know that Paul has already stood before Roman officials and every time he told them that salvation was by faith in Christ and believe in him. And so Paul says, they, they know I'm set for the defense of the gospel. That's the, the latter. Then he says the former in verse 17, they, the, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. He said, they're proclaiming Christ, hoping to make me mad. They're saying, ha, 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 Paul, we get to do it and you don't. Well, Paul says, I still get to do it because nothing can stop the message. But they're doing it with the wrong motive. So let me ask you a question. What's your motive for doing what you do? For serving when you serve? Because Paul, he goes on to say that whether it's pretest or false motive, it doesn't matter to him. So what is your motive? Why do we do what we do? Is it that we might look good compared to somebody else? Or that we might want to say, well, I'm doing more than this person? Or is it really out of love, out of love for Jesus and out of love for anyone else? In fact, according to this passage, you, you, can, you can do good things, proclaim the gospel with the wrong motive. And that's what he's saying. And so Paul says this, he says, what then? It doesn't matter. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. He says, I don't care. I'm going to keep on rejoicing. In fact, Paul didn't care who received the credit as long as the gospel was being proclaimed. Paul didn't worry about it. So why? Why don't you do what you do? 
You might say, well, I'm not really doing anything. Okay, well, then start. And then as you start, ask why you're going to do it. Because why do we do it? Do we do it to look good? Or we do it because we love Jesus Christ? That's the motive. And so Paul says, and it's a little strange. He says, I don't, I don't really care. They may be doing it for the wrong motive, but as long as they're proclaiming the gospel, I'm happy about that. I'm okay. Now, with that in mind, we're almost through. And, and look what he says. He says, for this I know, and this is, this is really powerful here. This I know that this will turn out from my deliverance through your prayers and the provisions of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He says, I think what's going to happen is I'm going to be delivered from here. And he calls it my salvation. He uses the Greek word, which is a word that's all throughout the Bible, that it means a, a deliverance, salvation. Sometimes it can mean eternal life salvation. Sometimes it just means a physical deliverance. In this passage, Paul is talking about physical deliverance from prison. He says, I know through your prayers and through Jesus, one of these days I'm going to be delivered. But delivered in which way? Well, either out of prison or death. So he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's either going to get out of prison. And when he stands before Rome and the Caesar listens to him, the Caesar's either going to say, you're okay, and he can leave. Or the Caesar's going to say, I'm going to put you to death. And so he doesn't know. But he's saying, no matter what, one of these days I'm getting out. Through your prayers and through Jesus Christ, I'm going to get out. And that's what he actually says. Through the Philippians' prayers and through the provision of Jesus Christ, I'm going to get out. And so that's why I think it's, it's very important that you pray. Some people say, and we, we have a Thursday morning group of guys and a Friday morning group of guys and some other things, and sometimes we raise some hard questions, and, and uh, a question could be asked, because some people say, look, if God is sovereign and he works everything according to the counsel of his will, why pray? Is it going to do any good? The answer is, yeah, everything, everything we do. Listen, everything you do fits in God's sovereign plan, but you're a counsel, accountable for everything you do. How that works is beyond our comprehension. That's why the Bible says, Oh, the depths of riches, both the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past five and out. So pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. He says, I know I'm going to get released because of your prayers and because Jesus Christ is working as well. And then he ends with this famous verse, which I, I think we just really need to highlight. And look what he says. According to my earnest expectation and hope, this is what's big for me, I will not be put to shame in anything, but in all boldness, Christ, even now, even now, will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. Here's what he says. My goal is that this is my eager desire that Jesus Christ would be lifted up. What is your desire? What do you want to see happen? He says... That in the negative, first of all, that I will not be put to shame in anything. You know what he's thinking? What if he gets put before the Caesar and he loses his nerve and he's afraid to say what he should say? He said, I, I don't, I don't want to be put to shame. I don't want to not, I don't want to fail. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that, listen, uh, that uh, my earnest hope and goal is that I won't fail, but with all boldness, even now, whether I live or die, Jesus Christ will be lifted up and glorified. That's the goal. What do you want out of your life? Do you want to live for Jesus Christ? Do you want him to be glorified in everything? That's what we need. That's what we want. We want that. And, that's, that's in my, and I'm talking to me just as much as I'm talking to you. I want my life to count for Christ. I know you do. But we need to be bold and we need to stand and we know that the pressure's coming and sometimes there are going to be things that we want to say to ourselves, I, I don't want to ever... Uh, uh, be ashamed. I don't want to shrink back, but I want to, I want to stand strong for Jesus Christ. And that's what we want. And he says, whether I live or die, think about that. Whether you live or die, we just don't know what's going to happen. I found this uh, Norwegian prayer. I put it up in the first service. I've already had like four people come up to me and say, and I get that prayer. It's a great prayer because it deals with because Paul says, I don't know what's going to happen, whether I live or die, but I want to glorify God. Look at this prayer right here. He says this, Lord, if it be to your glory, heal suddenly. If it will glorify you more, heal gradually. If it will glorify you even more, make your servant remain sick a while. And if it will glorify your name still more, take him to yourself in heaven. What do we care about? 
We just care that our lives would count for Christ, that wherever he wants us to go, whatever he wants us to do, we'd, we'd have to take the opportunities, we'd be bold to stand for Christ. So let me quickly give you the applications. Let's trust God, God in the circumstances of our lives. Listen, there is nothing by chance. Nothing can stop the message of Jesus Christ. Paul's in prison, but he says the message keeps going. People are out there telling the message keeps going. We have to trust God because nothing can stop it. In fact, that's the second one. Nothing can stop the word of God. It is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. That's Hebrews 4.12. It never comes back void, but accomplishes its purpose. Isaiah 55.11. It is profitable. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. Listen, the word of God is alive. Always use the word. Always give the message from the scripture. It is your authority and it is your power. So proclaim that message. We can be bold in those truths. The second one is let's just proclaim the gospel. We know the message. We know the response. We know the offer. He died and rose again. Whoever believes has eternal life. That's it. Be ready to proclaim it. You have the message. I'm going to say this in a nice way. A lot of people don't have the message. A lot of people have never understood it. It's been confused. They've heard things that are confusing. They've never seen it in the Bible. They've never understood it. You have it. We have this great grace message of salvation. We need to proclaim it as, as, as often as we can with boldness. Our end result is that we want our lives that Jesus will be glorified and magnified. In fact, that we would want to be a great testimony for Jesus Christ.